job prospects are bleak. One in four 16 to 24 year olds in Britain right now are out of work. 40% of all knife crime is carried out by under 18s. Why won't he deliver on his promise and put them in jail? We have come to a stage in British culture where we are scared of our young people. With constant critical and non-beneficial stereotypes in the media around the youths of today, young people are finding it more and more difficult to find work and more importantly, a place in society. I aim to look beyond these stereotypes, finally giving the young people of today a voice, finding out what life is really like to be a youth in today's broken Britain. At the age of 14, I became estranged from my family and I had very little contact with them until the age of 18. And I did all the things that you see in the newspapers, you know, the antisocial behaviour, the getting arrested, the taking drugs, the drinking. And, yeah, I did that. I've, I've changed now and I've been lucky in the way that I had people who were supporting me and that could keep me on track. But for a lot of young people, that isn't the case. That is not the case at all. And they look for acceptance in things such as gangs and groups that include a lot of drinking or taking drugs and I think that that's sort of the basis of this it's acceptance. It was something like a third of our students were from non-traditional academic backgrounds so they were the first people in their family to ever go and do a degree so they didn't really have that backup from parents or anybody to say that's a brilliant idea they had parents going what the fuck are you doing that for get a job what do you want a degree for? so much fun to try to use, right? Connections have stopped, yeah? The job that I'm working in now, I've only got to stop. It seems like these that prove that there are young people out there with passion and ambition. Young people who don't see their future behind bars, and who are we to take that away from them? I've scheduled an interview with a lady called Becky. She's a probation officer and works a lot with youths. I want to find out what the core of these problems are, and I think that she's the right person to go to. Two of the young people that I work with for the longest period of time um, both came from very broken homes. Um, no real male role model, um, even though one of them was female, I think that still would have been really beneficial to her. Um, both of them really, really nice kids, um, and I was really, really fond of both of them actually. I'd probably come to say they're my favourite, as well as being my most difficult. Um, one of them unfortunately is now in prison as an adult. Um, I as his officer, managed to keep him on community orders out of prison um, for a good year and a half. Um, then unfortunately, not just because I stopped working with him, um, but I did stop working with him and eventually he ended up, uh, as I said, in prison. Um, his support from his mother and his father was completely minimal um, and he had serious mental health difficulties, suffered with depression, self-harm. Um, he worked with our mental health team, which were absolutely fantastic. I couldn't in any way um, give them any kind of doubt. They, they were brilliant. Um, but even with all of these different interactions from different people, from different from social services, mental health, from YOS, from a team called the ISS team, which is um, uh, an intensive supervision programme, it just wasn't enough for him, unfortunately. Is it too late? Mm. You know, because... Yeah. If they'd had that help three years ago, maybe they wouldn't have been in this position, but then how do they get out there and find those kids that need that help? And how do they measure? Listening to the stories of the two young people not only was heartbreaking, but essential. The people of Britain need to hear these stories for them to feel empathy rather than anger. She also asked the vital question, is it too late? What policies are in place to get to these kids before they dissolve into the justice system? In order to find this out, I've booked an interview with MP Tim Lawton. He's the Child Minister of the UK. Hopefully this interview will answer a lot of questions left open at the end of the interview with Becky. It's really essential that you intervene early and you work with those families who need additional um, support, who aren't able, like some middle class families, to find their way around the system, what support is there, through children's centres, through health um, visitors, through decent childcare facilities, better quality nurseries or whatever, to get a better start in life. Too many kids who come from less well-off backgrounds, who come from broken families, who come from deprived areas, there is an expectation almost that they will fail, 
they'll do badly, they're not going to succeed at school, they're not going to get the five decent um, A to C GCSEs or go to A levels or, or whatever, so we may as well not bother with them. That is completely wrong and I don't believe that anybody should be written off just because of their, their background. You've got different levels, you've got young people whose parents unfortunately haven't taken much of an interest um, or come from a criminal background themselves, um, therefore of course it's just learnt behaviour and they're going straight into those kinds of, uh, of actions and, and ways of being. Um, but then you've also got kids that come out of the care system so they really don't have anyone. There are about a third of young people leaving primary school without the expected level of literacy and numeracy. And what tends to happen to a lot of those kids is they will begin to disengage when they get to secondary school, particularly teenage boys. If they haven't got the numeracy and literacy skills to follow lessons, they will start to switch off. Then they become a bit disruptive. Then you have behavioural problems, all sorts of other pressures going on as well. Then they get excluded. Ultimately, they might get expelled, end up in PRUs, slippery slope to crime and the youth justice system, etc., etc. It's just so predictable. The young girl that I worked with went to prison for a short time. Um, she is definitely living up to a stereotype. Um, she's very hard, as you might say, um, and she cannot go about her business without living up to this, this stereotype which she is fulfilling. Um, I think now, probably, um, she's with a foster family which she finally managed to uh, to work with and to live with quite happily for the first time at 17 years old um, but still I assume she's going to be in and out of the system as well and she also had some serious mental health difficulties and emotional difficulties, attachment disorders, um, neither of these kids stayed in school, uh, neither of these kids are achievers. It's a, it's a real problem, it's a real issue, and it's something I've always banged on about for years and years and years. Um, Children Young People Now magazine did a survey some years ago where they identified 71%, I think it was, of stories about young people in the media are negative, mostly around antisocial behaviour, crime, getting into trouble, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, about a year ago, Bernardo's did a really alarming survey, which I don't believe, but I think it's an indicator of people's um, moods at the time. 44% of the public felt that uh, young people were feral with all the sort of negative connotations that goes with that. And in 2005, there was a much bigger survey that said that as many as one and a half million people would want to move home because of the problems of young people hanging around in their, uh, in their neighbourhood. All those things are bad and are negative and are not at all representative of real young people, but they lead people to accept stereotypes. And so if, to read some tabloid newspapers, you'd think that every... 14, 15 year old was a hoodie wearing potential mugger mm. and I think that has contributed to one of the biggest social problems in society um, which has deteriorated many years and that's a breakdown in trust between generations. I think until, until we learn how to stop being afraid of our own children and we're brave enough to say we're making, this is your common room, like in, in parks. You see it in parks now, though, where they, the council stopped trying to make the skateboarders go away and gave them a bit and put a few ramps in and said, you can do whatever the hell you want with it. It's yours. Graffiti it as much as you like. Then they take ownership of it, and then you see a culture developing that's really something. And, OK, Ethel walking a dog past a load of youth on, on their skateboards might be a bit nervous but I, what I see is that they keep to their own culture they look after it they throw people off if they're doing hard drugs or causing trouble and they sort of self-regulate so I, I think that's the, the trick is trust people and give them some power and see what they do with it not take it away and assume that they're going to cause trouble build it into the building we don't want you to hang out here that's just ridiculous. So what, what we have to do is to remind people time and time and time again and try and entice the media to cover it that young people actually do some really interesting and good stuff day in, day out. The riots that happened over a year ago. Now to look at the front page of all the newspapers and to look at all the TV coverage, you would think that this was purely a load of teenagers up in arms taken to the streets. If you look at the statistics in terms of those people who were then 
um, prosecuted and went through the, the courts, it was, in the end, I think it was fewer than 20% were actually young people, 18 or, um, or below. I just got back from my interview with Tim Lawton. Um, I thought that a lot of what he said was great in the way that it built on what Becky had said previously um, about sort of the breakdown of family units and the education system failing young people. Um, he also said that young people feel like they're being set up to fail, which I thought was really good that he said that because it sort of backs up everything I've already said and sort of proves to me that I'm going in the right direction with my project. Uh, I think that after these two interviews, I'm going to definitely be moving on to education now. I'm going to get some interviews sorted out with some schools and see sort of what, what policies they have in place when it comes to you know, young people who are coming from troubled backgrounds and stuff and sort of see what what they what they have to say about it. So I do think it's about choice really. I think if somebody gets it that they've got more choice than they thought they had, whether they get a degree or not, whether they get a first two one, two two, pass, whatever, if somebody sees that they've got more choice than they thought they had in their life, that's that's my measure of success. But I don't think somebody who's come from a posh, rich family is any less deserving of that than somebody who's had an awful background and been brought up in a shitty council estate. I think everybody deserves it. It's just people need different things. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, how much of an issue do you think that is for like people not to have anything at all? It's a big issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A big issue. Because I think I, then I think that's when young people go off. Sometimes they can go off the routes because they have nothing to do. So, from what you've said, I've done enough research and found out that, like you said, options and choice are a big part of it. A lot of these young people don't have the options or they don't feel they have the options and they feel that they've got sort of everyone's against them. So, do you think that the government has taken, from your personal opinion, from what you've seen, and your experience with young people, do you think that the government is taking um, taking it as seriously as they should be to be setting up these these sort of projects to help these young young people? Oh, it's complicated. You know, we've got a government in at the moment that are very different from the previous government. So I've been around a lot of youth work and a lot of projects and schemes and. Uh, both Conservative and Labour governments. Um, Labour, in my personal opinion, tend to care a bit more for people, particularly at the what we might term as the bottom end of society, or the poorer end of society. But the problem with a lot of work is it becomes very tokenistic. So you, most organisations, most youth, most youth organisations, get funding on either an annual basis or a project basis. So somebody has to be paid quite a lot of money to write a proposal, to send it off for the funding, to get the funding to do a thing. And that, so in actual fact, so if the youth organisation gets 40 grand for a project, 20 grand of that will probably be spent on the person who wrote the funding bid to get the project. And that's usually some nice white middle class person who's got a nice cosy office job who doesn't, in my experience, usually like people very much. Um, just a quick recap, sort of, on what's been going on. My case study could have made me today, and it was sort of the last chance before her going away that I could do that. Hopefully, I'll get another chance. I'm a bit worried, but I'm sure it's going to be fine. I've got quite a lot of... Um, ideas of people that could help me with this project and that would be happy to sort of help and give their personal experiences and stuff. This was obviously a problem that was going to happen. People, you know, aren't comfortable with sharing deep experiences. But obviously I took that risk on when I decided to do such a emotional topic. <laughs>